father's making you whole He's waking up your sleeping soul The father's making you whole He's waking up your sleeping soul The father's making you whole Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up He's waking up your sleeping soul You're not forsaken, no Father's making you whole Wake up, wake up, wake up He's waking up your sleeping soul The Father's making you whole Father's making you whole the Father's making you whole He's demanding you, He's demanding you The Father's making you whole He's demanding you, He's demanding you The Father's making you whole Lord Jesus, this morning we just want to bring before you every broken person those who have become so accustomed to their brokenness that they identify themselves with it. They don't know what life is like without that brokenness. We lay them before you today, Lord Jesus, and we pray for healing and restoration. I pray, Lord Jesus, even for those who have been written off by their families, who feel like they don't have a family, who feel like they don't have parents, may they remember their identity, that they are sons and they are daughters of the Most High God, that they are not forsaken, that they are loved, that they are cared for. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this morning, may we not be afraid of the porter's wheel, but may we allow you to mend us and mold us, because God, you love us too much to leave us broken. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will touch each and every broken heart, each and every broken soul, even those that have experienced deficiencies in their relationships with their fathers, God. I just pray, Lord Jesus, that they may take on the identity of sonship, that they may take on the identity of daughtership, that they may remember who they are. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this morning you will breathe life into our dry bones. You will breathe life into our dry vessels so that they might live live. I pray that this might be a reminder this morning that the Father is making you whole, that He is waking up your sleeping soul. Wake up, Son of God. Wake up, daughter of God, and take your rightful place. Wake up, wake up, wake up. The Father's making you whole this morning. You are not what happened to you. You are not what they said to you, but you are who God says you are. And you can do all that he says that you can do. This morning, God, we wear the identity that you have given us, the identity that Jesus Christ purchased on the cross. We say no to all shame, oh God, all guilt. We lay it down at your feet this morning. May you be glorified and be lifted up, oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed, amen. Grace, peace, and joy be multiplied unto you. Our God is an awesome God. Welcome to the preaching of the Word of the Lord. And our subject today is Jehovah Shalom. And before I get into the subject, I just want to submit to you this day that Jehovah, the I am that I am, is the most comprehensive name, the incommunicable name of God. You know, when we talk of God, God comes across as a generic term, like a no-name label. Any man anywhere in the whole world who worships some form of a deity, they refer to that deity as God. But as we meet this day, I just want to declare that we're talking about Jehovah, the great I am, the self-existent one, the self-sufficient one, the maker and creator of all things, the one who's not derived, but everything derives from him. He stands alone. He is the ultimate sovereign. 
All authority on earth is derived, but he has authority in himself, and he does not derive his authority from any constituency. When we look at political power and political leadership, people get into power because they are voted into power by the electorate. They derive their power from their support base, from their constituents. But God derives his power from himself. He needs no prop. He needs nothing. If we were to remove water, air, and everything from the earth, all life would cease as we know it. But when it comes to God, there is nothing that he needs. He doesn't even need me as a preacher standing in this pulpit this day. If I were not here, God would have used somebody else. There is no need in God. He is the self-existent one. And as we stand here, the name Jehovah is so vast, it's incomprehensible. It's all-encompassing. So when we talk of Jehovah, we talk of the great I am, the I am that I am. But throughout history, what man has done in order to get to a place of a better understanding of who Jehovah is. At each and every turn of people's experiences, they add words to the name Jehovah to describe some experience that they've had, some characteristic of God that they've come to learn and know because of an intimate experience. Before I get into my subject this day, I just want to declare that throughout the Bible, Every time men interacted with God in a time of desperate need, they experienced another facet of Jehovah's characteristics. The very first mention of that we see when Abraham had been instructed to go to one of the mountains in Moriah to sacrifice his son, his only son Isaac. And just before he could take the knife and cut the neck of his son, the Lord spoke. And in that moment, Abraham realized one thing that the Lord sees, the Lord will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh. You got to call him Jehovah Jireh. The second time we see another compound name of God in Scripture is when Moses was first with a desperate battle against Amalek. And when Israel was losing, Aaron and Hare raised Moses' hands to heaven. And as they did so, God gave them a great victory against the Amalekites. And in that moment, Moses realized that he is Jehovah Nisi, the banner of our victory. And after that, we get to a place where the Messiah is announced in the book of Jeremiah in a time of desperate need amongst the Israelites. They had fallen into sin. They had gone astray after strange gods. And God spoke through Jeremiah that he's going to raise a branch of righteousness, even in the house of David, referring to Christ the Messiah. And at that moment, Jeremiah declared, Jehovah Tzidikenu, the Lord our righteousness. The fifth time that we see, you know, another compound name of God, of Jehovah being revealed is when Israel was in exile. And in the 25th year of their exile, you know, the Lord spoke through the prophet Ezekiel. And he spoke of the soon to come restoration of the city of Jerusalem. And he said, the presence of the Lord will be there. And the name of the city shall be called Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. So this day, brothers and sisters, I just want to declare to you that we serve an awesome God. Jehovah is unlike any other God. He stands alone. He's peerless. He's matchless. He's incomparable. There is none to liken him to. He stands alone in the whole universe. The Bible declares in Psalm 83 verse 18 that men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah at the most high over the whole earth. I will move on to speak of Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Judges, chapter 6, from verses 11 through to 24. And it reads thus, 
And there came an angel of the Lord, and set under an ark which was an Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abziarite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress, to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talk, talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I would tarry until thou come again. Verse 19. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, and unleavened cakes of an ephah of loaf, of flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put forth, he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the stuff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh, and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight, and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear, th fear not, Thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet an offer of the Abziarites. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. We find the nation of Israel in a very difficult situation. You know, after the, the fathers, we had uh, experienced the miracles and uh, the wonders of God through the 40 years of sojourning in the wilderness, he had all passed on and been buried. There arose another generation that knew not God. And they went a warring after strange gods and bow, you know, of the Canaanites. And as a result of that, God had delivered them over into the hand of the Midianites for a period of seven years. And in those seven years, the Midianites would always plunder Israel. They would come across the land like a flood, like a swarm of locusts at the time of the harvest. They would take all the harvest. They would take the ox. They would take the sheep. They would leave Israel impoverished. It was a desperate situation. Israel was in a sorry state from the glistening heights of the law-giving ceremony at Mount Sinai, Israel had lost their way. They had forgotten the great signs of God that he had wrought in the wilderness. They had forgotten about the parting of the Red Sea. They had forgotten about the supernatural sustenance of God while they were in the wilderness, during which time their footwear did not wear out. Their clothing did not wear out, and there was none sick amongst them, because Jehovah Rapha was in their midst. 
This same Israel had forgotten about the bread from heaven. They had eaten the food of angels. Their forefathers had eaten the food of angels. The manna from heaven. God had done awesome and amazing things. Even prior to getting into the promised land, God opened the river Jordan and they crossed on the riverbed as on a pavement. They had forgotten about the great exploits of God in bringing down the walls of Jericho and defeating the seven Canaanite kings. They moved away from a rich heritage and circled in a valley, a valley of unbelief, a valley of apostasy, a valley of turning their backs on the one and only true God, Jehovah. And they raised unto themselves idols in place of the sovereign God. This is the point where we find Israel. And as we find them, the Bible tells me in the opening verses of chapter 6 that the situation was desperate. Israel was oppressed. Israel was impoverished. They had set up for themselves caves where they could hide dens and strongholds, where they could hide their food from the marauding invaders, the Midianites. These Midianites had been defeated before by Moses. The story is recorded in Numbers chapter 31. They had been defeated before, but Israel moved away from God and a, a previously subdued enemy came back to haunt them. And in the midst of their anguish and desperate situation, my Bible tells me that they cried out unto God. And when they cried out unto God, the Bible says God sent a prophet, a nameless prophet, to remind them of their sin. God reminded them that he was the same God who had brought them out of the house of bondage in Egypt and wrote great signs and wonders in, in his deliverance of them. He reminded them that he is the only true God and if they move away from him, there would be dire consequences for the whole nation. In their cry to God, God responded. In the midst of their chaos and turmoil, they remembered one thing. They tried bow. I'm sure they'd cried to bow countless times and they'd received no response. There was no respite for them from bow. Then they remembered that there is a true and living God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He is the one who declares in his word that call unto me, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know of. He is the God who hears and responds. He is living and powerful. In the midst of their desperation, God heard them. And this morning, I just want to submit before you that in the midst of the desperate situation globally, and even here in this nation, where countless people have lost their lives, and some are in hospitals, and you know, fighting for their lives. Uh, businesses have gone bankrupt and uh, some are jobless. Fear bounds on the right hand and on the left. Hopelessness is everywhere. In a situation such as this, I just want to exhort you this morning that we can cry out to God in humbling ourselves and turning to God and crying out to the God of heaven. Desperate times call for desperate prayers. And when desperate prayers are made unto God, our God responds and answers. Our God is a serving God. He is a God who is personal and involved. He is not far removed from our circumstances. And this morning I want to challenge you, brothers and sisters, dear friends, Beginning tomorrow, the 11th of January to the 31st of January, we have as a church sanctified a fast to humble ourselves before the God of heaven, to abstain from the comforts of this present life 
and take time to seek the face of God, to consecrate our lives and to lay everything at his feet and seek his mercies and his grace. I encourage you to set time to join in in this fast from the 11th of January to the 31st of January. We give time to God to move on our behalf. We pray not only for our needs, for the needs of our families, our friends, our colleagues, and need, the needs of this nation, and indeed the whole wild world. Our God is a God who answers prayers. Hallelujah. Now turning on to Gideon, a man who encounters God in very uh, strange circumstances. Gideon was in hiding. He was in a cave, threshing wheat in a wine press. A wine press is meant, you know, for producing wine from grapes. But because of the upside situation, you know, the, the upside down situation he found himself in, everything was abnormal. Gideon was hiding in a cave and Gideon, an Israelite. You know, when God refers to Israel, he refers to them as his firstborn amongst all the nations of the earth. And when we look at his promises in the book of Exodus, when he was talking to Moses, that just one of them would put to flight a thousand enemies. And two of them would put to flight 10,000 enemy soldiers. But in this situation, we find Gideon, an Israelite, a descendant of the patriarchs. You know, the nation of Israel to whom belong the promises, the glory, the giving of the law, the covenants, are now hiding in caves, imprisoned, or in other words, imprisoning themselves in dens and caves because of their sin and forsaking God. Enemies that they had previously subdued were now subduing them. You know, the sad thing about sin is that sin robs any man or woman of their energy and power and strength and renders them weaklings and bring them to a place where they need to hide. We see this even in the story of our first parents, Adam and Eve. After they fell into sin, they went into hiding. Sin cannot stand the light of the glory of God. So when Gideon is found in a cave, threshing wheat in a wine press, you know, he's shaken to the core when he realizes that the very same God that he has heard of through oral tradition and hearsay in his community. The same God who had wrote ten signs in the land of Egypt before taking the children of Israel out. The same God who had carried them on the wings of an eagle throughout the 40 years of their sojourn in the wilderness. All that he, know, he knew about him was just a name from stories, from hearsay. But on this glorious, beautiful day, you know, the God that he had heard of in oral tradition, the God of the hearsay, was standing before him face to face. The God that he had thought was dead long and gone and had forgotten about Israel appeared before Gideon, a, Gideon, a man who was godless, he belonged to a household whose father had sponsored the erection of an altar unto Baal. He had grown up in that culture. There was nothing in him to show that he was a godly man. He was in the midst of an idolatrous nation. He was stuck in the clutches of an idolatrous culture. He had heard of Jehovah. 
It was just a name, a tradition, which his fathers had told him of. That was all he knew about the God of Israel. And when God appears to him, it is amazing that God still greets Gideon in a way that is honorable. He calls him a mighty man of valor. You know, Gideon was engaged in an important task. Possibly he had just a few kilos of uh, wheat to thresh for the sustenance of his whole family, hiding in a cave, hiding it away from the Midianites. He was engaged in a good cause. It is amazing that every time we look in Scripture, when God calls a man, he always calls a man or a woman who's engaged in some meaningful activity. And it is not different with Gideon. But after the awesome proclamation, Gideon blames God for forsaking Israel. He says to God, why have all these things befallen us? If you are still with us, where is the God of our fathers? Where are the signs and wonders that we were told of? Why have you forsaken us? And when this happened, it is amazing that God does not respond you know, in a dialogue manner to his uh, fears and his uh, argument. The amazing thing is that he blames God for forsaking Israel. We are always blinded to our, own, to our own faults. When we sin and falter, we never see the fault in ourselves. It's elsewhere. It lies elsewhere. He blames God for forsaking Israel. But if anything, it's Israel we had forsaken God. And when we forsake God, any move away from God, we are worse off. When we move towards God, we get better and better. And Gideon is very doubtful when God gives him the mandate of freeing Israel. What I just want to say is that true faith is often weak. It's often feeble. But it's faith nonetheless. The Lord Jesus Christ said, If you have a faith that is as small as a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, Be thou moved and be cast into the ocean. It shall be done. This morning, this day, in the hour that we are faced with, I just want to declare that in spite of all the doubts that Gideon had, the peace of God that he experienced passed into a peace with God. The Bible says we are now justified by faith and we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And as we trust in, that, in what Christ has done, there is a tranquility in trusting. There is a rest in submission. And when Gideon stood at that place, he declared that he is Jehovah Shalom. He erected an altar unto God and called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. And after he had done that, he was instructed by God to destroy the altar of Baal. And in place of that altar, to erect an altar unto God and sacrifice two bullocks unto God. What I just want to say this morning, anything that has replaced God in our lives should be struck down before we can see a move of God. Before we can experience the power of God. Before we can see the greatness of God. And when the angel appeared to Gideon, the purpose of that visitation was to prepare him to free Israel, to deliver him from the Midianites. I want to submit to you, before, to submit to you this morning that the greatest preparation for, for warfare is the peace of God. As a Christian, you are called to a life of continual warfare. There is no retirement. You may retire from your office, but you don't retire from the call of God. It's a call that you must remain in until you breathe the last and you'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul at the end of your life that the time of my departure is at hand and I'm ready to be offered as a drink offering. 
and declare that you have fought a good fight. You have kept the faith and you have finished your course. And henceforth is laid up for you a crown of righteousness which the righteous judge will give that day. And this morning, Christian soldier, march on with your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everywhere you go, every heart, every individual that you meet, be able to erect the altar, Jehovah Shalom. You know, every household that you enter into, be able to erect the altar, Jehovah Shalom, and declare the peace of God in every life, in every household. Even in this dire hour that we, we, we are currently living in, Christian soldiers march on to lands near and afar off and declare that Jehovah is the, the, the peace. He is Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. And the peace that we have is a peace that is independent of circumstances. When, when Gideon erected that altar, that, you know, that, that monument, it was not an altar for purposes of sacrifice, but a mon monument unto God's faithfulness that God is peace. And this morning I want to declare that God is peace. He is peace in the midst of the raging storms of life. He is peace, you know, when the chips are down and the odds are against us. He is peace when everything is stacked against us. And I want to declare as I draw to a close this morning, that for peace to be obtained, there's got to be a war. There is no peace without a war. You know, at the end of the Second World War, the Allies stormed Germany from the south and the Russians from the east and defeated the Nazis. And after that, the Japanese refused to surrender, culminating in the USA dropping the atomic bombs on the twin cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. After that, the, the Second World War came to an end and the allies yet conquered. And I just want to declare this morning that it's only a conqueror who, who can declare peace. Since 1945 to this day, the world order is shaped according to the wishes of the victors. I want to submit to you this day that Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, conquered all. And because he conquered all, he has become the Prince of Peace. You know, God made a promise to, to, uh, to David pertaining to his son um, Solomon. You know, it's an amazing promise that God made. He said, Behold, a son shall be born unto you who shall be a man of peace, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be called Solomon, and I will give him peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. An awesome promise that God made to David. David fought his way to that, to that position. He fought his way to a place where his son Solomon could have rest and enjoy peace. He vanquished all the enemies that were in the land and established his kingdom. And his son ushered in an era of peace. And there were no drums of war during his reign. But I just want to declare to you this morning as I close that a greater than Solomon is here. The Bible declares that for unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David. Jesus Christ is the P Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ is Jehovah Shalom. He calms the raging storms of this present life. He calms the raging storms of your soul, of your heart, of your mind. He knows and understands everything. During his earthly sojourn, when he was traveling with his disciples across the Sea of Galilee, a storm arose and water began to fill the boat. And the disciples woke him up and said, Master, don't you care that we perish? 
And he rebuked them and said, O ye of little faith. Then after that, he commanded the storms, the, the waves, the tempest, the sea to a hushed silence. After he had done that, the disciples were amazed and said, What manner of this that even the seas obey him? I want to declare to you this morning that the same Jesus Christ in the 21st century is able to calm the storms of your life. And as we stand as believers in Jesus Christ in the 21st century, I declare to you that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And the peace that he gives, no one can take away. You may be distressed, you may be confused, you may be stretched beyond limits. I just want to declare this morning that Jesus can be your peace. You may not know him as your personal Lord and Savior. And he's calling out to you this day, come home, dear son, come home, dear daughter. You are loved just as you are. In place of Tamil, you will give you peace. Peace I give unto you. Peace I live with you in Jesus' name. Amen.